Will you, guys, will, will you guys stand and welcome Todd White to this? Come on. Come on. All right, reach your hands out. Reach your hands. Say, Father, anoint him for this room to release your spirit, to unleash your spirit upon us right now in Jesus' name. Let's go. Let's go. All right. All right. How many of you are lingering from first service? You're still here. Okay. All right. All right. Woo! <laughs> I just got to go up there and have fun with the kids, and it was neat. We had this one little boy that, I mean, I, first of all, I just taught on the Holy Spirit, and we got it real clear who he is, and they all believe he's God, the Holy Spirit, which is amazing. And I asked, who is Jesus? He said, Jesus, who is God? God, who is the Holy Spirit? God. So it was really neat to put it all into perspective. But I shared with them about the Holy Spirit that was upon Jesus because Jesus did what he did fully dependent upon God through agency of Holy Spirit. And so if I'm uncomfortable with things of the Spirit, I'm uncomfortable with the whole Christian life. <laughs> you know why you're uncomfortable with the whole Christian life? Because it requires the comforter, the comforter to fix that. The Holy Spirit is called the comforter. And God knew that you were required to be uncomfortable. So if you're comfortable without him, you're relying, in, you're relying on your own strength instead of his. And that never works. And it puts you into a, quite a, con, a quandary. Listen, I don't care how you got brought up. And how many of you were brought up religious? Okay, awesome. How you like my hair? No, I'm just kidding. I'm playing with you. When you get to heaven and find out that Jesus have dreads, all of you are going to freak out. <laughs> White as snow. That's all it says. It doesn't say they weren't locks. No, I'm just kidding. John the Baptist definitely had dreads. Did anybody see the Bible series? Did you watch the Bible series years ago that came out? John the Baptist had dreads. Did you see him? No. Locusts, honey, camel's hair, Nazarite. Didn't say comb. It just said locusts, honey, and camel's hair. All right. We got to be real careful about how we look at people and how we see people. You know, years ago, I don't know why I'm talking about this, but I feel that I need to. Years ago, like when I first got saved, I used to be a singer in a band, and I was a wild, wild, crazy, rowdy, in trouble all the time guy. And I had dreadlocks before. And I just always liked them, you know. And when I got saved, I went to Teen Challenge. And I got shot at from 10 feet away with 14 rounds. And God spared my life. And six months earlier, I had met Dan Moeller, who tried to get me to surrender. But I didn't know how to surrender. And how do you be like Dan? I'm like, no way, dude. <laughs> like, but I know you're real. I just don't know how to get it. I, and all I had to do was surrender. I didn't surrender. I incorporated. So for five and a half months, I would go to church. I'd play the deal, and I would sing, and I loved singing, and I loved just the reality of, wow, I, I sing in a band. I can do this, you know? So I, I'm not actually surrendered for the first five and a half months. I went in. Let me just back up a little. I went in there, and I'm like, you know what? I'm just um, I, I just incorporated God in for what I could get from him. I thought maybe this could get my girlfriend to stay. Maybe I could manipulate with this name. And I played the game and I went there on a Sunday and I saw these people doing worship and I was like, I got this. I can sing that stuff. That's easy because I'm a singer in a screamo band. I'm like, I can do that too. So I'm singing, I exalt me. That's not the song. But that's what I was thinking. I'm thinking, if I sing real loud, people aren't going to see my junk. They're not going to see all the stuff. They're not going to see how twisted I am. And if I sing real loud and people are like, whoa, bro, you, man, you got a gift, man. You, you should be on that worship team. They just didn't know. And Dan knew. And Dan wasn't about to put me on the worship team. <laughs> Do you, know, you all know Dan Moeller. You know what I'm talking about. So he's my model. He's the guy I meet when I first 
incorporated God. You know, what had happened is I, my, my girlfriend that I'd been with for nine years and my seven and a half year old kid, I tormented and lied and stole and destroyed their life. And, and I was done with my life. I was finished. And I said, if you ever leave me for somebody else, I'm killing you and I'm killing them. I'm gonna make you watch and then I'm gonna kill myself and leave our daughter with nobody. And that's the way I thought. And it was selfish and it was suicidal and it was just the way life was. And by then, I had already been extradited across America twice, kicked out of the military, in and out of jail, bad conduct discharge, $14,000 in court costs. I had four felonies and three misdemeanors and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> my life was jacked up. And so I went to a, a gun cabinet because my girlfriend had left, left me a note, said, I'm leaving and, and I, I never want to see you again. And my daughter left another note and said, we're at grandma's, but mommy's never coming home. I love you, daddy. And I drove to her stepdad's to get a rifle, and on the way to the gun cabinet, I flipped a phone book open. It opens to churches, and it just happened to be Dan Muller's church. What are the odds? <laughs> and I drove to this church as angry as could be, and Dan was there, and it was hard for me to look in his eyes because something was real inside of there. Because the Bible says that if your eye is single, in Matthew 6, your whole body will be full of light. And he's talking in the context of money, actually, because he says right before that, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy and thieves can't break in and steal. For where your, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So he's saying, don't put it here, but put it there. And he's talking in the context of money, and he says, you know, it says that I, let your eye be single. If the eye is single, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye is not single, there's darkness there. And how great is that darkness? Meaning we have the capacity to house light, but if I don't surrender and see things from God's perspective, repent, repent, relook at things. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at it's within your reach, it's within your grasp, but you have to change the way that you see things. You have to relook at things from heaven's perspective instead of man's perspective. If I look at things from man's perspective, I'm setting up for myself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. But if I'm looking at things from God's perspective, I see that seed is something financially. My words become seed spiritually that my whole life can transform and change. But I don't know any of that stuff because there's no mind renewal going on. There is just the incorporation of Jesus, a lack of surrender, and trying to maneuver and manipulate to get my way. In the name of Jesus. I know no Christians do that, but I did. And so Dan tells me, since you don't want your life, because I told him I wanted to kill myself, he said, well, since you don't want your life, why don't you give it to somebody that wants it? Here's the problem. Why would anybody want this? Because all I did was steal, kill, destroy. All I did was lie. All I did was let's sell bad drugs. Someone gets bad drugs, they die. I mean, I was in that world. I was in that realm. That's what happens. I get shot at, like, and somebody, somebody like, thinks I'm dead. But then another guy gets shot that looks like me the next week because they think it was the guy that ripped him off the week before. There is a crazy life that's in there. All that stuff. So I... And with Dan, Dan says, since you don't want your life, why don't you give it to somebody that wants it? I said, who would want this, man? Come on, dude, be serious. He shared his testimony with me. And I go, dude, that is not you. Bro, get out of here, man. That's not you. He goes, no, that guy died. I said, you're crazy, bro. You're sitting here right in front of me and you died. He goes, no, the old man died. I go, you're not that old. What are you talking about? I didn't get it. Because it's not for the carnal mind. Because to the carnal mind, the carnal mind is at enmity. It's at war against God. We're, we're at war against God. This is a spiritual war. It is big, and we've got to get in the spirit and get out of the flesh. We've got to stop thinking the way that seems right to a man. We start to think like the way that is right to God. And when you look at that from God's perspective and look at it from the truth, the truth that most people don't search to find their answers. Most, most people freak out and assume what is, but you gotta know the truth, because Jesus wasn't just a way, he was the way. He wasn't just a truth, he is the truth. 
He isn't just some life, he's the life. And his life and his way and his truth is all about the Father. And the Father has good plans for you, plans to prosper you, not for your demise, but plans for you to prosper. In all things, people are like, prosper, I don't like that. Well, the Bible says that God desires you in 3 John, come on, to that God desires you to prosper and be in good health even as your If your soul's not prospering, your health is disastrous. My soul needs to prosper. But at this point, Dan is trying to tell me, I can look in his eyes and I saw light in his eyes and I knew this was real. But I didn't know how to get it. And I didn't know how to attain it. I didn't know it was this thing called surrender, which is one of the hardest things for everybody in the church. Because if I surrender, I don't know. I'm not used to not being in control. Oh, come on, dude. How many times we grow up in life, we need to control things. We need to, we need to be in control of things. And when we feel out of control, we feel like there's no possible way that I can do this because I'm not in control. You don't have to be a control freak to want to be in control. Are you with me? See, this is not Christianity. This is relinquishing all control to the Father to where you become this person that humbles themselves and believes that God is God and you are not, and you believe that he can set up his home inside of you through agency of Holy Spirit, and that God can have his way in and through you, and that God has required every one of us to do one thing after surrender. That one thing is to not be, Romans 12:1, is to offer your body as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God. Your body, that means everything, between the top of your head and the bottom of your feet and everything in between. Doesn't belong to you, it belongs to him. You are a sacrifice. Come on, what happens to sacrifices? Oh, come on, what happens to sacrifices? They die. Woo! But that sacrifice that dies isn't bad for you, it's good for you. Because what sacrifice is dying when you're a sacrifice? The way that seems right to a man must die so that the way that is right to God can live. So the enemy is constantly targeting self. He's constantly targeting this thing for you to nurture the carnal nature that needs to be crucified. The only way that you can get out of the nurturing of the carnal nature is to admit that you, when you were born again, you were born again of your spirit, so inside of your body, you are wall-to-wall Holy Ghost. You are wall-to-wall Holy Spirit. A third of you is Holy Ghost. He's in you. He wants to be upon you, but he's definitely in you. I always say he's in me for my sake, but he comes upon me for your sake. Because he wants to empower us. But there is a crucial piece that many Christians bypass. I would tell you upwards of 90% of Christians bypass in their life. And that is the strategic place that the enemy wages the greatest warfare that people are oblivious to. Have you ever, have you ever, there was a movie that came out just a little while ago. These Catholic priests made it. It was called Nefarious. Did anybody see it? Nefarious. It was rated R. It was a horror movie. How many of you watched it? I'm just kidding. It is crazy because it was rated R and it was a horror movie. I told my wife, I said, we're taking our kids. She goes, are you out of your mind? Like we have never watched a rated R horror movie since we've been saved. I said, we're watching this one. She goes, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, listen, two Catholic charismatic priests wrote this movie. And, and she goes, I don't care. It's rated R and horror. I said, that's because they want to draw people in. And here's the deal. The movie is, is about this guy. His name is Edward. And Edward is a serial killer. So Edward is on trial. He Actually, he, he was on trial, and he's been convicted of this. But... They need a psychiatrist to go in and visit Edward in order to deem him sane or insane. So 
on the day of execution that's going to happen at 11 p.m., this psychiatrist comes in. They had a psychiatrist that was working with Edward, but the psychiatrist went crazy and jumped off of a 20-story building and killed himself. And the warden says that the psychiatrist was driven crazy by this man, by the convict. Crazy. Now, C.S. Lewis wrote these book called, a book called The Screwtape Letters. This movie is based off of The Screwtape Letters. So you've got this guy named Edward, and he's in prison and you've got this psychiatrist that's an atheist that comes in to see him. So he says, hi, Edward, my name is so-and-so. He goes, you're not talking to Edward, you're talking to Nefarious. And he said, Nefarious, your name's Edward. He goes, nah, Edward's not here. So Nefarious just happens to be a demon. Now, this is a crazy confrontation between an atheist and a demon, which is weird, because atheists don't believe in demons. <laughs> and so he's talking to him, and, and he's sharing, and Edward is like, you know, Nefarious is talking through Edward, third person. He's like, oh, this is going to be easy, you know? And he's just sharing with, with this psychologist. And he goes, and the psychologist goes, how can you just possess a man? You can't just possess a man. He goes, no, you can't. It comes through a series of yeses. Oh, dude. What we don't see is the real war that's happening here. There is a demonic war that is strategically set up to nail you here in your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, to get you so focused on what's not true, to keep you from the very thing that is true, that you are so swirling inside that you never get a chance to actually accept and believe the word of God to be the truth that Jesus said, then they will know the truth and the truth will set them free. So watch, if there's a lack of free, look, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The Lord is the spirit, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Come on, and being transformed back into the original image, moving from bummer to bummer. It's not what it says. It's moving from glory to glory to glory to glory. Glory to glory is amazing. Are you with me? So big. So where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where religion is, there is no liberty. Where the spirit comes and he breathes on and he speaks to the soul, the truth of God's word comes alive. And the word of God, Hebrews 4.12, is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide and separate. First place of complete separation is able to divide and separate your soul from your spirit. When you get born again, you are wall-to-wall -wall Holy Ghost. What happens is the Holy Spirit is in you. Your spirit that's in you communes with Holy Spirit that's from God. All of a sudden, you have a soul, your mind, your will, and emotions. You are spirit, you are soul, you are body. Your body is a temple for your spirit and your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, the way that seems right to you, the way that you think, the way that your thought life, your history, your, your past, your present, your future. So all of a sudden, we bring Jesus in and we don't surrender our soul to him. We bring him in our spirits new. We plug into a church which is right and which is healthy. But instead of us feasting on the word, we feast on the world and we taste test Jesus. And when you feast on the world, you are what you eat. And people say, well, I just tried to read the word, and I just don't understand it, so I just like to listen to other preachers. I get it, but God doesn't want you to be an echo. He wants you to be a voice. Faith comes by and hearing by the word. So it's not me reading that brings faith. It's me connecting with God and hearing him as I read the word, and that is where faith comes from. Faith comes by hearing. In order to establish that, I first have to believe that God is. And then I have to believe that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. 
Now I have to see that in Hebrews 4, when he says the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide my soul from spirit. So what happens is my spirit communes with God. My spirit gets the word. My brain is going... (laughs) As my spirit gets the word, my brain is going bonkers because it doesn't get it. It doesn't need to get it. My spirit needs to get it. How many of you have baked bread? How many of you have cooked bread before? Isn't it amazing? But you don't pull it out before it's ready, right? You put that dough in, you put it in the oven, that thing rises and mm, gluten. (laughs) But it smells so good, but there's bread baking in the oven. That's what God's word does. It goes inside and it cooks. It goes inside and it starts to grow. It goes inside and it starts to permeate your soul. You don't see it, you can't feel it, but all of a sudden, God's word is alive, sharp. It divides your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions from your spirit. It cuts that thing off, why? Because this thing's the way that seems right to a man, the way that seems right. If you push me, I push you back. If you steal from me, I, 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 I tell the police. If you do this, it's, it's, it's gonna be this. These are consequences, I've been trained my whole life. Come on, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, it's the way it is. Hey, you wanna disrespect me, you wanna look at me like that? Guess what, we'll fight. It's the way that seems right to a man. Come on. Come on, you give to people and and you expect it back the way that seems right to a man. In the Bible, you give to people, you don't expect it back. Come on, in the Bible it says in Philippians 2, then I wanna treat others as greater than myself. In the gospel, it's look out, I mean in the world, it's look out for me, myself, and I. It's completely different from everything that we've been brought up with. And we incorporate Jesus in for a Sunday service, but we don't give him our life. We don't surrender everything. We sing, I surrender all except all this. I surrender all except my family. All to thee, my precious Savior, I surrender some. We sing these songs, they're gorgeous, they're beautiful, they're amazing, but really? The word of God is is where it's at. So what he does is he he separates the way that seems right and all of a sudden you start to read stuff and, and man, you're like, oh, that was awesome. Someone says, what was it? I don't know. I don't know, but it was awesome. Explain it, I don't know. What happened? There's bread that just got put in the oven and the heat is on and it's cooking and it's getting ready, but you ain't ready to give it away yet. Let God do it in you. What did Keith Green say? First help me take your word and shine it all around. Come on, let me take your word and shine it all around. First help me just to live in Lord. Take the word, bring it in, shine it all around. Let the whole world see the light of the glory of God in you. Man, all of a sudden we start to get the word in us and what didn't make sense before starts to make sense. Man, people go 50 years and never open their Bible. And they get mad when stuff happens and they still act like a baby. You know what fixes a baby? Milk. Come on, man. I mean, without milk, what's a baby going to do? Either breast milk or formula, but you better feed that kid. Come on, how many of you have had babies before? How many of you have given a baby a pacifier? And that pacifier is okay for a while. But when that baby's hungry, (laughs) am I wrong? I'm not wrong. When that baby's hungry, I don't care what you put in its mouth. (laughs) If it's not getting food, it doesn't matter what's there because that baby's hungry. And the body of Christ has become a bunch of thumb-sucking Christians looking at a pacifier to get through. And we need to feast on the truth of God's word. I'm serious. I can say this. Your pastor can't. Get mad at me. I'm not. Look, here's my deal. 
He told me this is the same as Lifestyle Christianity University. This is how I teach all of my students from day one. From the first day they come, I teach them that the greatest thing to hunger for is the truth of what God says to hunger for. He said, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. God promises a filling if you seek the right thing. And without righteousness, we are confused, we are hurt, we are bound, we are broken. And what I saw in Dan's eyes was this lamp, this thing that was real. And I'm like, man, I want what you have, but I don't know how to get it. And I had learning comprehension disorder, bipolar disorder, borderline schizophrenia. I have a lifetime subscription to issues. And this thing is whacked out and bound. I've never read a book before. And the Bible, when I went away, because five and a half months later, I go out and rip off a drug dealer one night, and the kid's in my car, and I tell him I'm a cop, and give me, your, give me all you got, and I take two eight balls of cocaine that he's got to answer for. He gets out of the car, and he unloads a nine millimeter from 10 feet away, right outside my window. 14 rounds of the gun go off, and I hear a voice in my car. And it says, I took those bullets for you. Are you ready to live for me yet? Now, you weren't in the car, but I was. And those blasts should have killed me and should have at least hit me, but none of them even struck the car. And it wasn't blanks, it was a gangster from New York City, a 15-year-old kid that had to answer, and he wasn't shooting like this, he was shooting like this in a window. So here, people are like, why are you the way you are? That's part of it. But I came back from this gun thing and I went to my house and my girlfriend's freaking screaming at me, get out of my life, I hate you. And I go to the only person that I ever saw Jesus in and that's Dan. I went to his house and I said, dude, I just got shot at, man. I said, he goes, what do you mean, what happened? And I told him, he goes, Todd, this is God. Todd, there's no way that he missed you. There's no possible way. Was your vehicle hit? I said, no. He goes, this is the Lord. Todd, you need to get help right now. I go, what do I do? A couple days later, I'm in Team Challenge rehab and I'm very thankful for being able to have a place to go you know I did I shaved my dreadlocks off I went into teen challenge I'm done I'm not doing this no more like I I'm not a band member I'm not a singer in a band I'm lost and I should be dead and he saved me from getting shot at I need to know him I don't even know how to find him I mean he's he's God he's not too hard to find he's pretty big are you with me? <laughs> but he's finding me. He found me. See, a lot of people are like, well, I found God. No, you didn't. Read your Bible. He's been searching for you your whole life. And I'm like, oh, oh, my gosh. When I go to Teen Challenge, I'm like, oh, my. Why? What do you want from me? Why do you want me? What did I do to deserve you? It's a lot of people's questions. A lot of people's questions that they, they get unanswered. They just keep going through life. And all of a sudden that why turns into worthless. Because they don't get an answer. And the devil loves to answer what he says. Well, yeah, you know what? You are worthless. All you've done is hurt people. I mean, come on, really? Do you really think that just blood in some book is able to wash you clean? Come on, that's stupid. It's the enemy. He's a liar. Well, you can't read that Bible. Besides, it was written by men. Men are fallible. Men are fallible. Why would you read some book written by men? Are you kidding me? Come on. When's the last time you knew somebody to be totally truthful with you? Don't think the enemy's not doing this full time, buddy. He's fully on it. He's fully on it because he just wants to twist it a little bit. What did he do to Eve? God said, don't eat this tree because the day you do it, you'll surely die. And Eve knew what God said because the devil said to her, did God really say? Did he really say? Well, yes, he did. He said, don't eat this tree. No, silly. God just knows that when you do it, you'll be like him. 
So Eve saw that the food was good, and she took of it, and she ate it. And she looked at Adam. She said, I didn't die. Here. I know all things. Adam listened to the voice of his wife instead of the voice of the father. And man plummeted. Listen. Satan's not up to anything new. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, oh, Paul says, you bear with me in a little foolishness, and indeed, you do bear with me, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's what he says. He says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, because I have betrothed you. I have set you up with one husband. One. I have set you up. I I have set you up, betrothed. I have picked out. You are the bride. Jesus is your husband, the bridegroom. I have picked you out, handpicked. But I fear that just as Satan deceived Eve, but right before he says that, he said that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. What does that mean? That means somebody that's never been with the world before. Oh, that means that Todd, who was a drug addict and an atheist and an angry person that hurt everybody, extradited across America, all these court costs, all these different things, all these felonies, that God sees me as if I've never been with the world. What does that mean? God sees me as if I've never done any of it. This is so hard for the human mind to get because we live guilty, ashamed, and condemned. But the cross speaks a better word. The blood speaks a better word. This is the Bible, guys. I don't know if you know it or not, but it's the word of God. Jesus attained something for us. He attained eternal redemption. I'm eternally right with God. Not because of what I did, because all of our Righteous acts are as filthy rags to the Father in our own acts of righteousness, in our own perfection, and in our own ability to get ourselves clean is all fallible, and none of it will stand. Come on. But God showed his goodness, his kindness, and his mercy when he sent his one and only son because God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that so whoever would believe in him. And that word believe means to be absolutely fully convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's not, well, you know, I, I kind of believe. No, 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 that's absolutely fully convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ was my substitute, that 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that he who knew no sin became sin for me so that I might become something. This needs to hit my heart when I'm at Teen Challenge, needs to hit my heart in my Christian life because unless I see this, I don't see what I've become and I will still be wrapped up in the works I've done my whole life and I will think that I still need to do to be instead of being to do. So Jesus became sin. He who knew no sin became sin so that I might become the righteousness of God that is in Christ Jesus. The whole Bible testifies of what righteousness is. In the Old Testament, 613 laws, 10 commandments. If you obey all of them, not missing them, it would be accounted to you. It would be laid up into your account that you'd be right with God. Romans 4 talks about Abraham being the example being justified by faith because he believed that God would raise his son from the dead even if he sacrificed him. Are you with me? It was given to Abraham righteousness. God said, stand before me and be righteousness. Abraham believed by faith. Therefore, it was accounted to him righteousness. You and I must believe by faith that righteousness has been laid up into our account. But you have to see the truth of this gospel. See, Jesus Christ, when he was born of the Virgin Mary, he wasn't born as God when he was on the earth. 
Jesus Christ was fully the Son of God, but in order for him to fulfill the covenant that God made with man, Jesus had to live his life as the Son of Man on this earth. Because God made a covenant with Moses, and the only way that covenant gets fulfilled is if man fulfills his end of covenant. God had his end, perfect and holy. Here's my law. If you obey all these commandments I put before you today and not go to the left and to the right, it will be accounted to you righteousness. So the whole mission statement of man was to try to be right with God. The Jews would, would put phylacteries on their foreheads. They would strap leather bands around their arms to keep them in a place of prayer. They would do everything they possibly could, but everybody sinned and fell short of the glory of God because God wasn't looking for people to see the law as an opportunity to be right with God. God was showing them the law to show them how far away they were from God. The law wasn't given to show us our way to God. The law was given to show us how far we were away from God and that we needed to fully depend upon God. The story of Israel in the Old Testament was continually coming back, running away, coming back, running away, coming back, running away. God had mercy and sent his one and only son so that God could stop the running away. <laughs> oh, he did it for us. He didn't do it so that you would have to do it. He did it so that you could believe that what he did was enough. Jesus became the propitiation. He became our substitute. Jesus grew up as a young boy into, you know, in, a baby into a toddler, into a young boy, into a, a teenager, into a young man. And he did it all in his humanity. He didn't do it in his divinity. He was fully God and fully man. But in order for him to fulfill the covenant that God made with Moses, he had to fulfill the law as a man, not as God. When a covenant is made, it's made between two parties. Those two, party, two parties were God and man. So God had his end, he's holy. Now man had to have his end. So Jesus Christ, growing up, born of the Virgin Mary, goes through life and never sins, ever. Jesus' brothers had it hard. Can you imagine that? Why can't you be like your brother? What? James in the Bible, his real name was Jacob. You imagine Jacob's life. I mean, these guys didn't even believe that Jesus was Jesus. Are you with me? But, but how much of a tood would you have had if your brother was absolutely perfect? He's more than goody two-shoes. <laughs> like, he can't make a mistake. He could, but he didn't. In anything that he did, in anything that he said, in every action that he had, in every word that he spoke, in every attitude, there was an attitude, there was gratitude. His whole life, he lived that way. He lived that way so he was being groomed to die. Jesus was being groomed to die, man, his whole life. So at 30 years old, Jesus comes down to the River Jordan, and he looks at this wild man named John the Baptist. Repent! Come on. You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Herod! You took your brother's wife. Herod! Dude, that's him. That's John. He's a wild man. And people are going, we got to go see this dude. But John was just there to prepare the way for the Lord, come on, Pharisees, come out to him. Why are you, who are you, Elijah? No. Come on, are you one of the prop? No. You, who are you and why do you baptize? I baptize you with water. I love it. But the one coming after me, whose sandals I'm not even fit to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So John says to Pharisees, after he called him a brood of vipers. God can raise up children from these stones. Woo. Man, I love that. He preached repentance. Jesus comes down to the river. John, I need to baptize me. So that righteousness might be fulfilled. Why righteousness being fulfilled? Why? 
Because the law, all the law, all the commandments, 613 laws, 10 commandments, Jesus walked them all out at 30 years old. He comes down to the River Jordan, and John the Baptist is like, I need your baptism. What are you doing coming to me? Jesus said, it's necessary so that righteousness be fulfilled. John the Baptist consents. What are you going to do? Say no. He baptizes Jesus. Jesus comes out of the water. The Holy Ghost descended from heaven like a dove, rested upon him and remained. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is led by the, by the Holy Ghost into the wilderness. He goes out there comes back out after temptation in the Holy Ghost in power, goes about doing good, healing all that were oppressed by the devil, and he's on a rampage destroying hell. Every opportunity, boom, boom, Satan can't touch him, Satan can't kill him, Jesus had to lay his life down in order for it to be taken because it can't be taken from him. Come on, the devil... The devil, if he would have known, it says, if the powers and principalities would have known what they were doing, they would have never crucified Jesus. But they did. So, there must be some kind of huge cover-up scam in hell. There must be some kind of huge confusion that they're trying to cause to muddy that thing up because real destruction happened. See, Jesus let the devil, let him put him on a tree. He let him get him whipped. Come on, he was whipped and he was bruised for our transgressions and our healing. Are you with me? Do you know that God wasn't sad in heaven? I know that the passion showed a raindrop. It, it looked like a teardrop, but it wasn't a teardrop. It actually said it free, it pleased the Father to bruise the Son. Why? Because he knew you were the joy set before him, he pursued the cross, it didn't pursue him. For the joy set before him, he pursued the cross because he knew that you and I were on the other side. <laughs> he knew that Todd has wrapped up and is twisted and as lost as he is. He knew that Todd was on the other side of that cross. He knew that 2,000 years later that Todd had destroyed everything. He had threatened to kill his girlfriend. His daughter had watched him act like an animal, that people are dead because of Todd's life. He knew that Todd White in 2004 was going to be in a drug deal gone wrong and deserved to die, actually incorporated Jesus into his life and then faked it in church for five and a half months was the biggest hypocrite. His girlfriend said, you're a liar, a loser, and a hypocrite. I will never believe in a God that's not real. Five and a half months old, and the Lord out there in a drug deal gone wrong, rip off a drug dealer, that I deserve to die because I ripped off a kid that has to answer for that money, and people die every day from drug addiction right here in Wichita. Every day, because drugs are everywhere, and God says, I took those bullets for you, are you ready? live for me yet. I go to Teen Challenge, I, I meet Jesus, I, I meet him, and I absolutely believe that God says that this is the covenant I will make. See, when Jesus was on the tree, he who knew no sin became sin so that I might become something. So what happens is when I said yes to Jesus, at first I incorporated, but then God showed me that in the covenant, the new covenant, he says their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So all my sin and all my lawless deeds, and God says this about everyone. The devil wants to torment you, twist you. He wants to constantly get you to look back instead of looking forward. And it says in the Bible, in Romans 8, when you look at verse 38, it says, I'm fully persuaded that neither angels nor principalities nor Come on, nor life, nor death, nor things present. No, it says nor things present, nor things to come, nor any of nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate me from receiving the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. There is one thing that's not on that list. It says angels, principalities, powers. It says life, death, 
things present, things to come. It skips right over your past because God has removed your past and has dealt with your past and the blood of Jesus has washed over your past. And your past is the only thing that has the ability to separate you from receiving the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Because if your past still exists, the blood hasn't done its work. (laughs) This is not a counseling session. This is not something where I'm going to revisit your past. I'm telling you, you could revisit each individual thing for the rest of your life and never exhaust what the enemy will throw at you. Or you can just believe that Jesus said, my sins and my lawless deeds, he will remember no more. Jesus said, I will remove their sin as far as the east is from the west. Jesus said, that how much more shall the blood of Jesus cleanse my conscience from dead works in order to serve God? Or, and Jesus said, when I confess to God, he is faithful and just to cleanse me of all unrighteousness, which means when God sees me, he sees me as the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. God says, to be filled with the fullness of God is to know the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. So in order to be filled with this fullness, I have to know the love of God that's in Jesus. Well, what was in Jesus? My, my life, my life was the joy set before him. Jesus pursued the cross because he knew that on the other side of it, it was going to be me. He knew that one day I was actually going to believe, wait a minute, no more shackles, no more chains. I am free to run. We sing that in church when we walk out that door. I need to go back on Sunday so I can be free to run. It's not true. It's a lie. The enemy is killing us for lack of knowledge. And having received the knowledge, we reject it. There is this simplicity. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He said that, I have betrothed you. He said, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear that just as Satan deceived Eve, how did he deceive Eve? Did God really say? So what does he want us to do? He wants wants us to question God's word for the sake of satisfying our feelings. I'm going to say that again. He wants to get us to question God's word for the sake of satisfying a feeling that we have. I feel like God doesn't love me. And he wants you to settle with that because what I feel must be true because I feel it. So we've learned an emotional roller coaster Christianity to where it's this and this, it's not. John the Baptist said, every valley be brought up, every mountain be brought down, make a straight path for the Lord to travel. The truth of this gospel is you do not have to live with mountains and valleys. When a mountain comes, you speak to it and you move it. There is no reason for any of us to be susceptible to the devil's lies, to devil's lies. The only reason we are is because we don't know the truth and we haven't allowed the truth to set us free. If you are here in this place and you have not completely surrendered and given yourself to Jesus Christ, I want you to lift your hand right now. I want you to be honest with me. I want you, I want you to be honest. Be honest. Be honest. If you want that in your life and you want God to change your life, transform your life, and make you a mighty warrior for his kingdom, I want you to get up here right now. Come on. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on, man. Love you, man. Come on. Come on. Come on, man. Hey, this isn't a shame walk. This is a, I want God. I want God. I want the real living God. I want 
to burn for God. I want the reality of the real gospel. I want my heart to be filled with truth, possessed by truth. I don't want to believe the lies anymore. I don't want to believe the lies. God loves you, and he's head over heels for you, and he wants you to know him. Can I get a team up here to surround these folks? Come on. This isn't a shame thing. This is a, this is a, come on, let's not fall for this stuff anymore. Let's go after heaven. Let's go after heaven. Are you ready? Are you ready? Sick and tired of being sick and tired, man. Sick and tired of being sick and tired. Come on. Come on. Sick and tired of being sick and tired, man. Come on. Come on. Amen. We are exiting religion. We are entering into relationship. Because God doesn't want you to be religious. He wants you to be relational. He wants to overwhelm you. I am so proud of you. Oh, Jesus is going to use you and flip your world upside down. Oh, I'm not kidding. So, <laughs> amen is right. It's so awesome. Come on, I want you all to pray with me right now. Would you do that? Would you all pray with us? I want you to say this, Lord Jesus, Lord, Lord Jesus, I want everybody to pray. So if you're out there and you're not praying, you probably need to be up here. And if you're not praying, I'm going to ask you if you would like to go to hell. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. All right, thank you. I just want to make sure you're all in here. Today, Today. I, heard I heard truth. And truth awakened my soul. And I want you at all costs. I want you to show me who you created me to be. I don't want religion. I want relationship. Jesus, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I'm asking you, renew a right spirit within me. Right now, I surrender all. Take your word and open up my eyes. Give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. Help me grow. Help me plug in to a place that will feed me, to a family that will surround me. I forgive those that hurt me. My war is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities. My war is not against people. It's against the devil. Open my eyes. Help me renew my mind. And help me live my life for the glory of the King. In Jesus' precious name. Stretch your hands towards all the people up here, guys. Come on. Father, we thank you for every one of these people that have said yes to you. God, we ask you to overwhelm them, to absolutely overwhelm them, to intoxicate them with the truth of who you are, God, that they would be so enamored by your glory, by your goodness, and by your mercy. Father, we thank you. We're asking you do a good thing in them. Do a good thing in them. God, we thank you. We worship you. We give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Can all y'all tell them, welcome to the family. Come on. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. Amen. Amen. Come on. Hey, will you guys stand to your feet real quick? Todd, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing for everybody in here. Hey, Andy, will you take this group of mighty warriors here in just a minute? Everybody stay right where you're at. In just a minute, Andy's going to take you out here, and he's going to be with you. Stay right where you're at just for a second. Todd, will you just release? You have a gift of faith, and this room's hungry for it. So will you just release that? Yeah. Get in a position to receive. Yeah.
And God's just going it, to, it, that, that faith is going to be tied to the word. You're, you're going to read the word, you're going to eat the word, and it is going to come alive, yes, God, yes, and you're going to believe and just be doers of the word. You guys ready for that? Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God, for the gift of faith. Lord, I'm asking you to release that over everybody hearing this in Jesus' name, whether it's live, whether they're in the room, or whether it's archived. God, that you would spark in Jesus' name the reality of faith in everybody's heart. God, I'm asking you to bless them, overwhelm them. I thank you that you'd bless their businesses, bless their workplaces, overwhelm them, God, with prosperity. Ridiculous ridiculously, God, I thank you, Lord, radical, radical lovers of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you would release boldness into this room, God, into the platform, even online, God, even on archives, like I said, because the Word of God is alive and it transcends time. Jesus, I ask you, bless them, overwhelm them, let them walk in great victory. Jesus, I ask you for the free gift of righteousness to be imparted to everybody in this place. We are to reign as kings through the free gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace. God, I thank you for an overwhelming hunger for the truth of God's word, that we would never, ever, ever say it's stale, that God, you would release fresh manna from heaven, fresh manna, that God, fresh bread from heaven would overwhelm our souls. Jesus, we love you. God, we worship you. We give you honor. I thank you for this house. I thank you for this family. And I ask you to bless it and overwhelm the souls that are here. In Jesus' name.